explicitly mentions this. And then the second one, uh, the short story that I still like is Blawong. Uh, it is the name of a place in Yogyakarta, so it cannot be translated into English yet. So Blawong is Blawong, the name of a place. And this also this alludes to the story of Sambhadra in Wayang, in Wayang story. Uh, you know that Sambhadra is beautiful and coming from the royal, uh, the royal, what is it, the royal blood, uh, she was gentry. Again, the complexity is COVID and then there is a conflict between high and low class because the main character is a, a man from lower class and he falls in love with a woman from the upper class. And so this is the conflict. And then the feasibility and invisibility, this short story also uses a feasible method. It means explicitly explain uh, Sambhadra and the main characters uh, struggling for, for, for the success of uh, handling with the complexity and contradiction. The next one is Ternak Corona or Corona Farming. This alludes to the story of Rapunzel. Uh, so I think you are very familiar with Rapunzel. Okay. And then uh, beauty and captivity because of the quarantine, the main character has to be quarantined. And then uh, this short story is different from the first two, the previous two, invisible uh, method. The next one is Sayap Sayap the Atas Fabric, uh, or Wings on the Factory. This alludes to the story of Icarus and Daedalus. Uh, and then the effect of truth is power and freedom, because the main characters are struck in a factory. And the factory is turned into hospital for quarantine. And then, again, this one um, use uh, the method of invisibility about institutional analysis, okay, I consider the author. So all short story writers here are lecturers, university lecturers. So they are educated elite. And then the editor, uh, the editors are also lecturers. And then the publisher is uh, Universitas Kajamada. So again, this, this is also an institutional, uh, educational institution. And then this anthology was part of a project. And the project funding provider is Swiss National Science Foundation and Swiss Agency for Development and Cooperation. Okay. I come to the conclusion, all in all, the anthology under investigation is a kind of reminder for human beings to see any crisis, uh, including COVID-19 pandemic, as a try out to measure how well he or she knows him or herself. So the main characters are representation of human being facing the difficult time, facing crisis uh, in, 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 in the kind of COVID-19 pandemic. And then the anthology of Indonesian short stories, Waba, published in 2021, is the discourse whose production can never be separated from the articulation of power knowledge. So uh, the institution or the stakeholders that publish, the publishes this, this anthology should be considered for the full comprehension of what this story anthology means. Okay, I think uh, that's all that I can come up with. Uh, thank you for listening to my presentation. Okay, uh, thank you for our two presenters here. So now we are going to move to the opinions question and answer question. So please raise your hand and don't forget to mention your name before giving opinion question and any question, maybe. Oh, 
or we let our I'm sorry for sorry. For, let, our, let our discussion to give an opinion. Okay. Yeah, from this two paper. Thank you. Okay, so sure. should I comment on one paper or, or two? I think yes, they renewed the agenda, right? Yeah, they changed it, right? So only one, yeah. I think, right? Yes, uh, I will do for Baba the opinion oh, oh, for okay, great. for Baba Assis. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, I, I okay. Okay. So so I I'm. I read, actually I read both papers and I, I, I want to thank uh, Renzo for, for again holding this conference and I think it's a, a great opportunity for all of us to share our opinions and to, to bring our research together. So I'm very happy to be part of this again. And I, I really appreciate both presentations. Uh, let me comment first on the presentation by Professor Lan. Um, wow, I mean this is really fascinating research, right? Because basically you're talking about a micro study in in Python and you show how in your study here how they actually got relatively little grants but they actually did quite well, right? So in that sense it they show it shows that they're doing something right. And and this is is, is, is proven because they get these grants, right? So that, that's really clear. Now in your paper I, I like the way you express the the kind of, I'm a historian, so I like the history of it. If this policy, the Hakka language policy, it was invented or was started in the year 2000, right? So my first question would be, um, is that being evaluated by the Taiwanese government? Because we are now 2020, that's already like 20 years ago. So there must be some kind of study and results on what kind of results did that get? I think that's important because um, sometimes the government makes a policy and then they do something and then we're sort of, we don't know the results, right? So that, that's, that's one, one important thing. And then the, the second thing is, um, I've already mentioned you, that you've demonstrated really clearly how, how it worked quite well. And I also liked your theoretical framework because it was very visible and, and, and understandable. But you did your um, interviews, most of them in 2014, right? Yeah, that is also a little bit to be sorry to say <laughs> that's already eight years ago, right? So are you planning or have you been able to already follow up with more recent information? Because it would be really fascinating to see, uh, again, the time dimension. How have these mothers or these families been able to integrate over time? I think that would, be, that would give us a really interesting perspective, which would make your research so much richer and more more, more valuable for us to, to learn about. But so that, that's, that's my, my sort of follow-up, is, is interesting. And then also, I saw that in your interviews, most of the interviews were done with the people from the school itself, like the administrators and people like that. And um, I think that point is really clear, how they have multiple identities and how it's a multicultural society in a way and that they are trying to build a social cohesion through co co uh, cooperation. I think that's really fascinating. Um, but what could be perhaps a little bit more expressed is, like you mentioned a little bit the mothers and how they are from Hakka background and that therefore they can be teachers and can participate. But I'm missing a little bit the details. Like for instance, the one question also would be, what exactly teaching do they do? Because if you do teaching, you must have some kind of degree to be, you can't just come into a university or a school and start to teach, right? So there must be some regulations around that and their social role must be determined. And also, probably the, um, the, 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 the government officials must welcome that and not, I mean, there's so much more that we can learn, right? So I, I really will hope you, you have opportunity to, to to continue and, and, and expand on that, maybe explain a little bit more also. Um, and then, um, I think, yeah, and 6% of the, of, the, of the population is through residents and mostly in Indonesian, Indonesian women. It's, it, it really would be interesting to find out also what happened now with their children. Because you also mentioned that, right? You said there's one group of immigrants and then there's the, the brides and then there's the second generation. So I, I think this the case study of Python, precisely because it's manageable in size and has been quite successful, 
and it's a bit uh, away from the center because it's not in, in Tainan where there may be more Minan people are and it's not in Taipei where it's mostly Mandarin. It's, it's, a, it's a special area that, that, that is a really important strength and actually shows exactly what we're all talking about, this multicultural identity. So I, I, I hope you, you have an opportunity to do more, more research and I, I think it's it's got a great potential for it to be very soon. But maybe you could already explain a little bit more about the, the, the mother side because you alluded to it, but I felt we need more, we need more. Okay, yeah. thank you, that's mine. And should I also ask about or you want? Um, okay, Professor, I was hoping to do the opinion. No, 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 just uh, but one question also for yeah. Professor Aziz. Mm -hmm. um, so I also read your paper and I thought um, also well done, right? Excellent, uh, uh, good theory and edits. But you, in your conclusion and in your points on the institutional uh, institutional elements, mm -hmm. you mentioned, of course, that this was a Swiss uh, organization mm -hmm. that supported the university and then they selected all these stories, right? So I think uh, that 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 feels a little bit like there's already a filter there. There's already somebody making the decision who can go into right. the journal and who can go, or who can go into the book and who can go not into right. the book. And so I was wondering what your conclusion or what your point of view is, because and also you mentioned that actually in your conclusion, it seems that that sort of I don't want to say pollutes, but it sort of colors it colors the research a little bit because yeah you're stuck with the source material which is already selected. By, by somebody else, right? right? And I'm also thinking, uh, are you in the future looking, thinking of looking at other stories about the COVID pandemic? Because that would then create a more diverse picture and would also be really interesting. I think. Right, right. It will be that one question on the floor. Thank you for, uh, Professor Frank. So let's take the presenter to answer now or I later? Know, you, you, you. Okay. Uh, maybe maybe our presenter can answer now. Okay. I will do my opinion later. Uh, thank you, Frank, for the comments. So I'm the I'm from the public policy domain. I start to do the research from the uh, implement policy implementation and policy evaluation. But during the course of the study. I accidentally found this Indonesian model. They and they play significant role and also help to make this policy more effectively. And their policy, the policy outcome is more fruitful than other places in Taiwan, because Hakka language policy is a nation island-wide policy. But Taitong, like the, how to say that? Only the percentage of the Hakka population is not the highest, but they are they were fruitful there. So I went there to to check it out. So for I received a grant from National Science Council, and that's the reason I I, I went there. So and I did my research, and I accidentally found this the uniqueness of the Taidonese, Taidon case. So I present my paper and to, I, I also did the policy evaluation for Kaohsiung City, Tainan City, and also Taichung, Taichung City, and New Taipei City. I try to make a comparison among these different places. And the Taidon's case stands out because of the participation of the, these Indonesian models. The, uh, I, didn't, I could not find in other places, in other places. So I, that's the, the, the most interesting part about the title case. In terms of the policy evaluation, the Hakka Affair Council published every two years for the, uh, the policy report on the Hakka language, in a Hakka study or Hakka situation in general, 
So there are some parts of the, the about the policy uh, evaluation of the Hakka Elementary School. So they were quite fruitful, but they also they have uh, how to say that the challenge because most of the students when they left elementary school, they didn't continue to do the Hakka language learning in the middle school and senior high school because Hakka language will not test in the college and uh, admission or the high school admission. They didn't take into account. So that's the, 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 the challenge facing today. So the proof, the, the Hakka language school policy is fruitful only at the primary or elementary school level. There is a, how the, 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 the gap and stuck there. When they get into the high middle school, senior high school, and, and because they were not the mainstream courses, so they will drop out, they were they were quit. So that's the reason that after the policy evaluation, what they, the, the, the challenge they come out. I did that in 2000, actually to, from 2014 to 2016. And that I went to other places to conduct my study. So it's time to go back to Taidong again. So I, 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 I have I plan to go back next year uh, and next summer because I have stu uh, my I have a student, so I need this researcher, associate, uh, assistant to help me to collect the data. So it's I, I'm quite sure. I hope I can come back next year to present the update and the update version of this, uh, what happened to this Indonesian mother and what happened to these school children after six, seven years of late. So I will, I will introduce that. There, I'm not Hakka. I could not speak Hakka. That's the reason I could not interview these Hakka mothers. I just observed I went there and uh, observed their participation, and I communicate with their children, their 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 children. So, and they told me that, that it's quite interesting in those elementary school. In that elementary school, no one understand Taiwanese because half of them were Amis indigenous. They speak Mandarin and their and their tribe language. The other half, Hakka, they speak. Mandarin and Hakka. No one speak Taiwanese. So it's very hard to imagine in Taiwan there were pla there are places don't speak Taiwanese. So among their teachers, when they talk that what they want to share secret, they speak Taiwanese. <laughs> <laughs> Taiwanese. Okay, so that's quite interesting there also. Uh, so I have to overcome the language barrier between to do the interview or to get in touch more deeply from those uh, these Indonesian mothers so that I can get the, the story from their side. So uh, I hope I can get the funding this year, next for the next years. Although without funding, I will go there. Still, thank you for your encouragement. Thank you for Professor Lan, and maybe Baba Asis can answer. Yes. Thank you for your question, Professor Frank. Uh, okay, uh, it's about institutional element in the anthology. Yes, you are right. Uh, this this short story anthology is a part of a project, and then, of course, uh, they have their own way to select the short story to select uh, certain authors to produce uh, an anthology that serves their interests, of course. Uh, I agree with you uh, because to a certain extent, this short story anthology is produced in order to critique Indonesian government. Uh, because this short story was published in the early 2021, 
in that period, Indonesia has not yet successfully uh, deal with COVID-19. So in this case, uh, these education elites, so uh, as we can see in the, uh, on the slide, the editors are the lecturers, the publisher is UGM, Institutional uh, uh, Educational Institution. So they, they wanted to criticize the government, Jokowi government in this case. Why they did not yet, you know, did, yeah, why, why uh, they were not yet able to handle COVID-19 successfully. And then, uh, what about uh, my future project? Yes, uh, I will, I will select other anthologies, COVID-19 uh, short story anthologies. And one of my consideration is on selected short stories by Compass newspaper, published in 2020. So uh, in Indonesia, there is a national newspaper. It is called Compass, one of the biggest newspapers in Indonesia. Every Sunday, this newspaper publishes short story. And then every June, they you know, they releases a collection of selected short story, the best short story within a year. And then uh, one of my data is uh, the, the anthology of short story published by Compass uh, in uh, 2021, the same. So, but in this case, I also try to widen the scope of my research by considering what happened before COVID-19 and what happened after COVID-19. So, so that's why I will also consider the short stories published in uh, 2019 and then 2020 and 2021. So it is called post-COVID. Uh, so uh, as, I, as I told you before, this is a part of my dissertation project. That's why I have to widen the scope so that it will be uh, more comprehensive. And then I also consider uh, the conjunctural historical analysis, uh, especially about the crisis. Because if we read uh, the anthology by Compass, of course the short stories talk about COVID-19, but at the same time it is also uh, several short stories there talk about uh, economic crisis in 1997. And then also what happened in Indonesia during 1960s, uh, 1965, yeah, uh, the, what is it, uh, the, the tragedy of Indonesian Communist Party. So in this case, one anthology talks about a collection of crises. So in this case, I, I, I consider this also as uh, the part of the data that I will uh, analyze in my, my bigger project. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Oh, we still have time, and I need to give some opinion from, from Bapak Kasi's uh, paper. Okay, this is very interesting paper. I think we, uh, you discuss uh, the pandemic from the short movie, and you use the essential and constructive identity as your theory here to discuss uh, to see the main character in the in the short movie to to see whether or not they truly know themselves. And what I got uh, in your paper is the you stress that the release of the short movie is more likely to remind the public that COVID is nothing but just kind of examination to the test whether or not human being uh, truly know himself or not that. And you raised three questions on your research that how the pandemic is constructed or built and how the institution related to the pandemic and are constructs, uh, constructed and how the constitution construct, construction disclosed the identity of the individual and institution. But uh, uh, maybe I'm not really, I'm not read it very clearly so I missed something uh, your detail in your paper. 
I don't see that in your paper that uh, you answer the answer the question that already you write in your paper. Maybe I, I look I miss the detail. And what kind of the uh, how the identity of the social built during by the pandemic and what kind of the and it has been built on, on the time. And you also mentioned that the, you use the theory of Syriacus. That uh, yes, Syriacus. You said that identity plays a major role when the purpose is for recognition, protection, and uh, cultivation of human identities. And your uh, conclusion is there are three characters in the short movie can be defined. One is those who succeed in recognizing themselves. Mm -hmm. The second is those who fail in identifying themselves. And the third is not yet. So, um, of course, I not I not watch the six and all the movies. I just what uh, just give opinion from what I read from your paper. Mm -hmm. So why there is a such recognition of identity needs to be stressed in the story, and the ethnic group need to be what ethnic group need to be protected me? I'm not really sure here. Maybe uh, Baba Asis can give uh, us more detail about this. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you for your question. And then, uh, okay, uh, I analyze short stories, Indonesian short stories, and then why I relate this to why I relate this to uh, identity. Because, okay, uh, in my perspective, the COVID nineteen is a type of crisis, and then. Uh, in every crisis, human being is being tested, whether uh, he knows himself or herself or not. Okay, just like when you have a examination in school, it's also a type of crisis. It is, it is a kind of testing you, whether uh, you are prepared or not, whether you are. Uh, smart enough or not to handle this kind of crisis. The same as this one. Okay, so actually this is based on my perspective. Uh, so in this perspective, I try to develop the discussion about identity and the discussion about uh, institution and so on. So, of course, uh, maybe other readers have their own perspective. It's okay. So a literary work is open to interpretation, right? And then each interpretation is, of course, based on a certain kind of perspective. Uh, yes, I think that's all. Why, why, why I relate this to the, the to this, why I relate COVID nineteen to this, to this discussion about identity. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, I have I have one more, huh? and you mentioned you discussed more about. Use or reuse Indonesian way in coping with the with the COVID pandemic. What what is meaning of use or reuse Indonesian ways here? Okay, uh, there are some indigenous indigenous ways uh, to deal with COVID nineteen. For example, for example, in Indonesia, uh, people have traditional herbal medicine called jamu. Yeah. So maybe you still remember uh, uh, two or three years ago, even the government of Indonesia suggested people to consider jamu mm -hmm. in order to, uh, what is it, to make your, uh, to make your body strong enough to face COVID-19 virus. So in some short stories, uh, these short stories explicitly mention uh, this kind of traditional methodology to deal with virus. Okay, so that's that's what I mean by <laughs> uh, the indigenous ways to, to deal with uh, this this kind of virus. Okay. Uh, when, if you didn't see the short movie, I think if you didn't get what this means of the use or reuse the Indonesian way. Maybe there is other explanation except the medicine. I also guess maybe it's about the Jamo medicine. Yeah. Uh, uh, okay. Papa or plague 
is not only COVID-19. In the past, there were also types of weapons. And Indonesian people had their own ways to deal with this. For example, uh, providing, uh, I forgot the name, it's a kind of uh, wooden uh, or uh, padusan, yeah. it is called padusan. <laughs> It is the place where people can wash their hands and it is put in front of every houses in Yogyakarta, in Yogyakarta.